The Sony PlayStation 4 launched in North America in November of 2013 and with it a new generation of video gaming. As with any new game console launch, questions arise about the security, and in some cases the systems are rushed to market with perhaps less testing than necessary, and exploit entry points can be determined. But in this modern day and age of cryptography, per console CPU keys, encryption, data execution prevention and more, means that exploits are becoming much more difficult to identify. Unlike the PlayStation 3 and the Sony consoles that came before it, this time Sony did its homework. The PlayStation 4 was a very secure piece of hardware. The days of soldering on an 11 y mod chip to glitch the data bus or spam reset the CPU are long gone. If there was an exploit to find, it would be in software, and most likely be at the user level security access. But even the most secure console has its weak points. After the Sony PlayStation 3 was so famously exploited with its jailbreak device, for the PlayStation 4, Sony would invest heavily in security, with the first year and a half of the console launch having no public announcements ever made regarding hacking. And many people believe that the Sony PlayStation 4 security has never been defeated. But that is not true. What you may not be aware of is, yes, the PlayStation 4 security has been defeated with a timeline of various exploits since 2015, which means that unsigned code execution is possible and there is a homebrew community surrounding the PlayStation 4, albeit much smaller than, say, the Nintendo Switch. So, when we think about the Sony PlayStation 4, we don't immediately think that is a system that has been defeated from a security standpoint. But the reality is, there has been exploits on the Sony PlayStation 4 since about 2015 that have allowed the system to run unsigned code. The Sony PS4 was the first Sony console to support the x86 architecture. The single chip custom AMD processor houses the CPU, which is an 8-core processor codenamed Jaguar, and the GPU, a custom AMD-based Radeon graphics engine running at 1.84 teraflops. The PS4 also consists of 8GB of GDDR5 RAM, and either 500GB or 1TB of internal storage, depending on the model. The mid-generation refresh, the PlayStation 4 Pro, offered some hardware updates for more power, but the underlying architecture and operating system were the same. And this, of course, was for compatibility reasons. The PlayStation 4's operating system is known as Orbis and is based on FreeBSD, which is a Unix operating system. Much of the PS4's OS was developed with open source tools. And a quick glance at the license screen will walk you through all the pieces of open source software that was used to make up the Orbis OS. During the PS3 jailbreak era, it was possible to downgrade its firmware via use of booting the PS3 into factory service mode. The hardware was criticized for not using eFuse technology, which was used on the Xbox 360. When an update was pushed, a fuse would blow inside the processor. This meant that there was never any way to downgrade back to an exploitable version of a kernel. Interestingly enough, the Sony PS4 also does not use eFuses and utilizes revocationalists instead. During the early years of the PS4, motivation to jailbreak or exploit the system was always present. However, it was not anywhere near the levels of targeted attacks after Sony famously removed other OS from the PS3. But because the operating system Orbis is composed of many open source libraries, the first logical step would be to start there. The PS4 comes with a web browser, which is a part of the operating system. The engine, known as WebKit, is also used on browsers for other game systems, such as the PlayStation Vita, Nintendo 3DS, and Nintendo Wii U. WebKit would serve as the entry point for many exploits. It's open source and already has a history of known vulnerabilities. Perhaps some of them weren't patched on the PS4. The first public exploit was released by security researcher Sea Turt in 2015. Known as Bad Iret, this was a previously known kernel exploit that was discovered in Linux and FreeBSD. And when applied to a PS4 with firmware 1.76, the system was vulnerable. The exploit takes advantage of WebKit and its just-in-time execution to gain kernel access, resulting in system corruption and the ability to override a pointer and redirect the kernel. This was the first but an important step into running Homebrew on the PlayStation 4, but it also required a low firmware model and it wasn't very well known. Sony would simply remove just-in-time from the web browser. 
and ensure that for any game that needed to be played, you would need to be on the latest firmware revision, hence addressing the issue before it really became widespread. After the bad IRET kernel exploit was discovered and then patched, more work was done to identify newer exploits. CTIRT would also discover and release the DL close vulnerability, yet another kernel exploit for firmware 1.76 that was a buffer overflow. This exploit was also patched and CTIRT would then soon announce his retirement from PS4 security research. However, by this time, there were many expert level security researchers looking into exploiting the PlayStation 4 and because WebKit ran on other game consoles, discoveries were often found on other systems first, then ported to the PS4. This would go on for some time, with Sony quickly resolving them in firmware updates with a general improving system stability message. By 2017, the PlayStation 4 was at firmware 4.55, and a significant kernel vulnerability would be discovered. FreeBSD implemented a virtual machine known as BPF or Berkeley Packet Filter, which would provide a secure network layer and ensure reliable transmission of data packets and embed them in the kernel. A race condition situation can occur when two threads reference the same pointer. One thread would free the pointer while the other attempts to execute it post-free, and this allows a user to obtain an out-of-bounds write, which can then lead to code execution in supervisor or ring O mode. Sony patched this exploit in firmware 4.70, but they only patched the write functionality and not the core problem itself which remained. Security researcher SpectreDev wrote a similar exploit for firmware 5.05, which would be well known as the 505 PS4 exploit. By this point, the PS4 homebrew scene was gaining momentum, and homebrew developers would soon work on emulators, tools and applications for a jailbroken PS4. And if you were lucky enough to run a 5.05 firmware PS4, you can simply use what's known as a HEN or homebrew enabler that uses Sony's web browser as the entry point to trigger the BCF exploit and allow for unsigned code to run. 5.05 would be the last known exploitable PS4 for a few years, and this is partly the reason why the PS4 homebrew scene was quite small in comparison to others. As time progressed, finding an exploitable PS4 running 505 would be very scarce, and many believed that the PS4 homebrew scene was done. But in March of 2020, Andrew Newen, also known as The Flow, well-known security researcher who was instrumental in defeating security on the PlayStation Vita, announced that he was looking at security on the PlayStation 4 and advised users to stay on firmware 6.72 or lower if possible. And on July 6, The Flow then submitted his new exploit to PlayStation, who are offering a bounty reward. His kernel exploit would allow for the hijacking of kernel read-write primitives and code execution, and once again would use the WebKit as the entry point. Although a proof of concept, it was soon made available on the PS4. This meant that trying to track down a 6.72 firmware PlayStation 4 would be much easier. Due to the nature of the exploit, Sony had patched it before it was made public, but it does open up many more users who were interested in homebrew on the PS4. So what can you actually do with a modified Sony PlayStation 4? Well, let's take a quick look and show you some of the cool things that it's capable of doing. So to address the elephant in the room, yes, it's absolutely possible to play pirated games on a modded PS4, and I'm not going to dance around the issue. It's one of the reasons why people own a modded system in the first place. And with 6.72 means a much larger library of games that can be played on the system without requiring a system update. But my motivation is homebrew. And there are some really cool things that you can do with the PS4. And with the power of the console, makes it a great emulation box. First of all, you can enjoy many PS2 games on the system with the emulator that was developed for PS2 classics. It's nowhere near perfect, and the compatibility list is a bit hit and miss, but you can indeed play PS1 and PS2 games on your PS4. There is also a Linux distribution, which is great. Normally, Linux is not something that I'm really interested in, but this one is a little different. As you can see, it handles emulation quite well. It also comes with a Steam client, which allows you to log in and play from your Steam library. Not all games are compatible, the ones that require DirectX, for example, but anything that requires Vulkan or OpenGL should run. And in most instances, it runs quite well. 
You can also turn your PS4 into a Kodi Media Center. But if you don't like Linux, there are still some many great Orbis native applications as well, and overall it's a very interesting system to dive into. But unfortunately, the community just doesn't seem to be there. The small but dedicated group of individuals are working on PS4 Homebrew, but sadly the main reason for a system seems to be for pirated games. But still, 6.72 hopefully won't be the last PS4 exploit that comes out. It is interesting however, because as we know, Sony likes to issue firmware updates long after the hardware's end of life. But in conclusion, thanks to the hard work and dedication that security researchers put into the PlayStation 4, its security has indeed been defeated. But this time around, Sony has always been one step ahead rather than the other way around. Many people aren't even aware that there's even a homebrew scene on the PlayStation 4. What there is, however, is quite impressive, and hopefully we will see things continue as we move into the next generation with the PS5. So that is ultimately how the PlayStation 4 has been defeated from a security standpoint. Now, this time around, Sony has kept one step ahead of the hackers and security experts. In the past, it was kind of the other way around with the PSP and the PS Vita. It was always that cat and mouse game, but Sony has been very very good about security this time around on the PS4, but that's not to say you can't run unsigned code on a PlayStation 4. Now, before I go, I did want to leave a couple of links in the description below to some really comprehensive homebrew guides on the PlayStation 4, a lot better than what I had in my video. I was really just scratching the surface with what's possible on the PS4. So check those links out. They are far more comprehensive than what I have put in this particular video. Well, guys, we are going to leave it here. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.